Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, do we have Jaroslav Pernka, who will tell us about the scattering amplitudes and how they are related to geometry. Okay, thank you very much. Great to uh, be here back after two years. And uh, in this talk, uh, it will be mostly overview of some uh, progress on new understanding of uh, the S metrics from the geometric point of view, at least for certain theories. And uh, it will be kind of a brief overview, but uh, there will be also certain new results uh, that you gave in the last few months. Uh, but I will be happy to expand on any, any part of the talk, so please ask questions. Okay, but I will start very slow. So, uh, particle <coughs> scattering experiments is our way how to prove uh, fundamental laws of nature, like this picture from the LHC, when particles are scattered and there is a lot of. Uh, is this a real picture or artist's imagination? No, that's a real, well, <laughs> well under some. Well, it's too nice to be true. It's too <laughs> nice, well, you just add some color to. <laughs> to well, this is what experimentalists produce. That's not a theory speech. <laughs> but from the theoretical point of view, we are really interested in uh, what happens during the, during the scattering process. So for us, the scattering process is not the picture, the nice picture of the previous slide, but it's some big block. We only see incoming and outgoing states. And we would like to know what is, what is going on there. And of course, we have a picture of Feynman diagram, that the thing that is going on, are, uh, are represented by the Feynman diagram, and are some virtual processes. Processes of virtual particles, particles are created, uh, annihilated, and more, and more complicated than the diagrams. Uh, we have to consider to capture the higher orders uh, in the perturbation theory. Now, uh, we, in the last few years, we got a new picture, equivalent picture to what's going on. And instead of Feynman diagrams, we can theoretically describe it using these diagrams, which look similar, but are quite different. They are called Moncho diagrams, and uh, I, will, uh, I will tell more about them later in the talk. Uh, but it's still some expansion, it's perturbative expansion, using some other objects, other than Feynman diagrams. But in certain case, of uh, maximally supersymmetric angles theory, we can go actually farther. And the thing which is in the block, from the theoretical point of view, can be also understood as some geometry. And the S matrix that we calculate corresponds to a volume of some geometry like this uh, polyhedron in some simple case. Okay, so that's uh, what the talk will be about, to kind of say more about uh, uh, let me just start that the uh, perturbative quantum field theory is our way how to do theoretical predictions of particle, uh, particle collisions. And of course, as always, we start with the Lagrangian for a given theory. We have a path integral. We do the perturbative expansion to Feynman diagram, which is organized in the leading order. We have trees, one loop, and then higher loops at the higher orders. And this is perfectly well understood. Every a graduate student learns that in the, in the course, and in principle, the problem is solved. Yeah, it's just somebody else to do these calculations. And more and more complicated, might be not able to do analytically, like the numerically, at some point, and even numerically. Uh, but in principle, the problem is solved. So who cares? Yeah. But, well, just to show that uh, this works extremely well. Uh, because while well, we have some theoretical theoretical framework we every, everybody agrees on, but it must be checked against experiments to actually verify that, that we are doing correct things. And of course, quantum field theory as a framework has passed a huge number of tests uh, since 30s when it was developed by Dirac and other people. Uh, and uh, the best uh, kind of the best example of how the uh, theoretical prediction agrees with experiment is magnetic dipole moment of electron, which was actually the original calculation done by Dirac in 1928, when some dimensional quantity g was uh, predicted by the theory to be equals to 2, and it was measured by experiment to be roughly the same number uh, around that time. And 
and in the in well, there are no final diagrams in 1978. They just use other version of the perturbation of the uh, other version of old perturbation theory. But in the modern language, it just corresponds to this three level, this three level Feynman diagram that Jira calculated. Uh, that was in 1928. There was a famous calculation done by Schwinger in 1947, which was a bundle calculation. Uh, actually, the formula is also on the Schwinger's grave uh, because uh, it became famous for that. And uh, this corresponds to this one loop, uh, uh, this one loop Feynman diagram. And it just corrected this uh, quantity G with the magnetic dipole moment. Uh, you see that there is a very small correction at the, on the third decimal digit. And it again agreed with the experiment very well in 1947. Then the tool of calculation that was already established, the perturbation theory using Feynman diagrams, was done in 1957. And it's this diagram, and there are more diagrams than that because you can imagine there could be different exchanges. And it actually took 15 years for experimentalists to, to get to the same precision level to verify that the theoretical prediction was correct. And uh, then the four loop calculation was done in 1990. And uh, now there is also five loop calculation. And this is, of course, you can see from diagram, this is in QED. There are also QCD corrections. Other corrections where we also calculated and everything. I think that uh, this is actually the best. Uh, this quantity is the best measured quantity in physics with respect to the theoretical prediction. I think. Why do you need QCD in this? Uh... Well, at some uh, well, some five loop uh, at five loop uh, at five loop order. There is some comparable. Uh, there is some comparable. Maybe it's not. But it's definitely it's a clean QED process, I thought, right? Yeah, yeah. Photon, but, photon, so loops. Yeah, but you have loops, so you just turn some other extra stuff oh, in the loops. The loops. Yeah, of course, at this, uh, this leading order, there is nothing. Oh, but okay, okay. At, I think the five loop calculation in QED is kind of comparable to one loop calculation in QCD or something like that. Yeah. So you have to really take everything into account in order to get to the gravity in event, right? So gravity in <laughs> <is> very, very <laughs> far. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm pushing my luck now. Okay. 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 Yeah. But do you need an independent measurement of Planck's constant? Planck constant. Why? Well, I, because it's expressed in terms of Planck constant theoretical answer. Right. So you need no, no, it's, a, it's just a number, right? It's a dimensionless number. It's just a number, yeah. So it's some ratio of things. Yeah, we are not really. It's an another. It's a. It's a dimensionless ratio of some stuff. So the Planck constant cancels. Yeah. So this, the thing that, well, of course there is a Planck constant in these diagrams, but you are extracting something in the vertex, right? And you are dividing by the Planck constant. Yeah. I don't know how experimental do it. Yeah. yeah. But they are just able to produce this stuff. Okay. So this was just for amusement. That of course. UFT works, perturbation theory works in this setup, and so we have a fantastic comparison between theory and experiment. However, we know that this is not all in quantum field theory. I'm not saying anything new, but we know that there is much more stuff going on. We know since early 90s that there are dualities between different theories, which, uh, which relate the strongly and weakly coupled regimes like ABS, CXT. There are different non perturbative methods that we cannot even use. Feynman diagrams of perturbation theory, and, uh, and they are still producing interesting results. So there is a general idea that there should be some new picture of UFT, that everything should somehow fit together and we should get some new picture. Uh, I'm not going to address that problem, but uh, kind of the punchline here is that if there is some new picture of how to think about UFT in general, which replaces everything with something else and generalizes in some way, we have no idea what the avatars of that should be seen even as weak coupling when Lagrangians and Feynman diagrams work perfectly. They are designed to work there. But if we see something new as weak coupling, there would be an evidence that even more is going on some, somewhere else. Yeah? But is this geometry supposed to capture the scattering of the Further but At the moment, everything is further but in the, in, the, in the case when we know most, which is plane and equals four super angles. There are no non-perturbative predictions. Exactly. 
the perturbation theory is actually convergent. The series is convergent. So we have a very luxurious position. But of course, there is much more going on in general QS. Yes. OK, so uh, that's the motivation. Why should something that generally doesn't converge be the uh, Why should that have a, a nice geometric description? But it shouldn't have been principal, right? I mean, I well, I, yeah. I can understand the one that does converge. In, in general. Right, so, well, I would, I, I'm thinking about, uh, OK, but that's just my personal attitude. Of course, the perturbation theory doesn't converge. Well, I would think about it more from the point of view that we are missing something. We don't. There are, of course, non-perturbative corrections, but it's not that you have this garbage perturbation theory, and then you have to add that in order to make all sense. I think that we are not really understanding perturbation theory. The, the things should talk to each other somehow. Yeah, it's once you know perturbation theory, you should be able to say what you have to add in the end to make it consistent. But it's just my speculation. Along the lines of resurgence. Along the lines, like that. Yeah, the resurgence is a way how to approach it. Of course, it doesn't work for QSDs. It's many much more complicated examples. They work at some lower level, but yeah, along these lines. So there should be something missing in perturbation theory. But a perturbation theory should give you a hint what you are missing. Yeah. But your duality should change you between your shapes, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I I don't have any statement about what the duality does for this geometry. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Right. OK, so let me uh, let me give you that evidence. And it's a very ancient evidence from today's point of view, but it kind of started everything. OK, so first, uh, what I think about scattering amplitude. So for me, the amplitudes are some functions of spin and external kinematics. So uh, momenta and some spin functions uh, they are useful because uh, uh, they describe the probabilities in the particle collisions of uh, that for a given initial state we find that we measure some uh, outgoing uh, some outgoing particles in some final state and of course it's related to the cross sections that experimentalists ultimately measure but I'm not going to talk about cross sections here the interesting thing, the kind of unexpected, is that the nice things really happen with the amplitude directly. Something which you cannot measure directly. You measure cross section, but from the QFT point of view, the amplitude is the central object. If all what I say will generalize many, many levels and so on, eventually one should be able to say something nice about cross section. But that's kind of five years from now at the moment. Okay, so. Uh, what are the amplitudes which, uh, uh, where, where this is relevant? Now, uh, this is of course relevant at particle colliders, and the biggest one in the world is LHC, uh, which scatters protons at very high energies. So if we scatter protons, of course protons are composite particles of quarks and gluons, but at very high energies, actually the gluonic part is dominant. There are processes, you can think about it as processes also including quarks, but effectively it's just gluons at very high energies. So if you want to predict what happens in these protonic collisions, you should be able to calculate the gluonic amplitudes and to very high orders to very high multiplicities. Okay. So the well, thing what that observation do they affect? Uh, jets or yeah, so, so the way so I will talk about mainly now about these gluonic amplitudes. Now you have to put them, you have to put some part on distribution functions to actually say how the gluons are represented in protons. Mm -hmm. So that's one way how to think about it. The other way how to think about it is indeed about jets, that we don't see individual gluons, but we see just some jets okay. uh, at high energies. Yeah. The interesting part of QCD is about these uh, part on distribution functions. That's kind of a mystery box. Yeah. Nobody really knows how to calculate them from first principles. People measure them. There is other easy parity stuff from a long time ago. But you really do kind of the simplest first step is just to talk about gluons. But it's not what we would eventually measure. We have to do extra step in the end to make it useful. So you give this to phenomenologists and then yeah, they dress up. With some yeah, they do shift enter uh, in some <laughs> code. <laughs> and because yes. they cannot do this stuff, but then they you don't want do to do the rest. <laughs> Yeah, but kind of my motivation is not 
Yeah, yeah, they are used. Yeah, absolutely, they are used. Yeah, they are used because uh, if you think about it, well, I will show you the next few slides. You you might think, okay, so let's just do some Luani calculations. It's uh, trivial. We have UCD. We have three point and four point vertices for gluons in the angular sphere. You just stick them together. What? We uh, we draw a bunch of diagrams. We calculate and done. Well, that's true, but the combinatoric becomes uh, very difficult. So let's just see what is the stage. So what we typically want to calculate in order to make some predictions of these processes is two gluons in the two gluons in the uh, in the initial state, they just scatter and you get a bunch of gluons in the final state. And there are also helicities, they have two helicities plus and minus, these are mass plus spin one pairs. So you have to just draw at three level, at eating order, you have to just draw a bunch of diagrams like that. Well, Okay, so people did it already a long time ago. LHC is not the first collider which scattered protons. Actually, the first calculations are from early 80s, when people did just that. Two gluons go to three gluons. Five point amplitude at three level. And if you just do it, the brute force calculation, you know, there is a 24 Feynman diagrams. You just evaluate that. You get 24 pages of this algebra. Yeah, once you expect it. And here is tiny dot here. Uh, it's just some kinematical expression. It's a scalar product of momenta and polarization vectors. And that's the result. Uh, can you okay. magnify this to see what this number is? Mean, what? I mean, can you well, this, well, you see, uh, are those numbers? Huh? Are those numbers, those uh, things outside the circle? <laughs> well, this is the same thing as in the circle. This is just zooming in. Okay, just, uh, I see. So there are many, many terms of yeah. this type. Yeah, each term sign. here in that circle is uh, kind of tiny, like things. There, if, uh, I see. But they're all of this type. They're, they're the all of this type. They are yeah, they're they're they are, type. Yeah, from the other, yeah, they are just, uh, they are just polynomials in and case. Once, and so one sign error, you're screwed up. You are screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Feynman diagrams tell you what well, <laughs> you shouldn't do a sign error, and you get a right result. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Once you screw up one sign, uh, yeah, it's it. wrong. Yeah, so. <laughs> Well, so we just, just roughly, how could it be that now? You have three Ks and five epsilons. And yeah, but well, you have to, the, the, the contractions is the problem. Yeah, you have the vertices, you have three vertices for five point Ks, and you just contract it and expand it. Yeah, so it, it gives a lot. Yeah. What loop are we talking about? No, this is just three. It's just three level. Just three level. Okay. Yeah, this is just five point three level. Well, one can use some, uh, in, well, this is what people in the 80s, there are few tricks, very trivial tricks, like ordering of particles using some column structure, which they didn't do at that time. And this is just raw results, and I'm kind of scared. This is uh, more scary people, yeah. It can be a little bit better, but in principle, you just have long polynomials into this stuff. Yeah. And they don't look particularly interesting. It's just k dot k, epsilon dot k, epsilon dot epsilon, blah, blah, blah. Sir all the labels, you have to permute them, they have different color, color structures and so on. Okay, so uh, that looks ugly, uh, but maybe not every uh, maybe not every question has a simple answer. Yeah? It might be just the final result and nothing can be done. Okay, well, the, talk, the final result is that this is not the case. Now, uh, in 1983, so why to do these calculations? Well, the motivation was experimental because in 1983, the SSC was approved in the United States. And the energy of SSC was supposed to go up to 40 TeV. This, for those who, who don't know, there was supposed to be a big circle collider here in Texas. And uh, it was canceled in 1991 after spending $2 billion after digging the big tunnel. Everything is possible and uh, yeah. So that's a sad story, but uh, kind of from the theoretical point of view, the good story was that people actually did the calculation needed for this collider, and the next one on the list was two gluons going to 40 ones. People already, pre they already uh, prepared in advance what should be needed, and it just took some time to do these calculations. Okay, so let me talk about this, because that was an important, uh, that was an important uh, result, which started the next progress. It was done in 1985 by uh, Stephen Park and Thomas Taylor. And it was summing 220 Feynman diagrams. And it was roughly 100 pages of the result that I showed before for Feynman. 
five point was twenty four, or six point was hundred twenty days, and uh, they finished the calculation. They got the result, and they rushed the uh, result. Uh, they rushed the paper to publication. They wrote a paper. It has fourteen pages. Uh, in 1985, the title is Gluonic 2 goes to 4, and they even didn't pretend any, any speculations or what it can be. Or They directly write just in the abstract, the cross-section for 2 gluon to 4 gluon scattering is given in a form suitable for fast numerical evaluation. Yeah, so their motivation was just to get the numerics under control for that simple three-level process, 2 goes to 4. Okay, and that's the paper. So they use some actual n equals to supersymmetry notation in order to kind of get the expressions more compact. Or in pages, there are some terms. So indeed, you can uh, you can classify these uh, kinematical polynomials in different uh, in different kind of sectors. And then so these are all the possible polynomials. And then they have some tables of coefficients in front of them. So that's the result table. And uh, in, the, in the conclusion, they also write that furthermore, we hope to obtain a simple analytic form for the answer, making our result not only an experimental, <coughs> but also a theory of delight. So it's not clear what they meant in, when they wrote that paper. But indeed, within, within a year, they realized that these uh, 14 pages can be written as a single line formula. And that's what we know today as our Taylor amplitudes or MH. It's a helicity amplitude, so you have to fix the external helicities of the state. And these brackets, uh, I will review it a little bit later, correspond to so-called spinner helicity variables. For massless particles, rather than using the four momenta, you can use a pair of uh, spinner variables, and uh, they are much more useful to brighten these results. But if you just care about the amplitude square, or the cross-section, you just square this amplitude, and instead of these brackets 1, 2, you just get p1 dot p2. So you can think about it like that. Amplitude square is p1 dot p2 q over p2 dot p3, p3 dot p4, and so on. So that's the result. OK, and actually, for one special helicity configuration, when you fix some minuses and pluses of gluons, this formula can be generalized to any number of points. It's something which you would never get from Feynman diagram because to calculate n points, of course, if n, the number of diagrams and the formulas increase, but for this helicity amplitude, the formula stays so trivial. But I'm sure they already, when they wrote the paper, they already guessed. Uh, what would you guess if you see this structure? 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very easy pattern recognition. What it can be, yeah. And, and this is really just ordinary QCD? This is just ordinary QCD. Symmetry, no, no. So, so yeah, so at three uh, level, uh, the supersymmetry doesn't play a role. So okay. you can think about it that QCD yeah. is supersymmetric at three okay. level. And what about, what about helicities? Do they pick a particular? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they did. So, so it's a 2 minus and n minus 2 pluses. Yeah, so 2 of them. 2 minus going to? 2 minus going in and. And everything plus else plus, plus going in also. So that's so, cheating. Uh, well, it's a one. So, so this is not a general amplitude for n point. It's one helicity. But if you want to get it from Feynman diagrams, you have to calculate the general. You true, have to calculate true, everything true. and then reduce. Was yeah. their calculation also for this helicity? The yes, 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 yes. They wanted to do for this helicity. And if I have arbitrary helicity in the nutshell, how does the answer get complicated? OK, well, I, I can tell you. So, so this, uh, this result for 6 doesn't get more complicated. There is one more expression, which is slightly more complicated, but not. I can write it on two lines for the other helicity component. Of course, for endpoint, there are many more possibilities. Yeah. Okay. So the formulas are not, so this is just kind of a tip of the iceberg, how the formula can be simple. Uh, for the other LACDs, it gets more complicated, but it's extremely controlled. Yeah, I will show a little bit later. OK, OK. So let's just now look at the Feynman diagrams and to see what's going on. So, so the idea is that if you see some unexpected simplicity like that, there are no accidents. It cannot be just accidents. This particular amplitude is simple. Everything else is garbage and complicated. But if you look at Feynman diagrams more closely, we can actually see what is going on. So of course, Feynman diagrams are extremely good because you can 
you can use them for any quantum field theory that have be different particles, not just gluons, different masses, couplings. And you have a prescription how to do any calculation, not just three, but also loops. So it's very general, and of course it works. Now, uh, from more point of view of physical principles, you can see what is special about them, or what, what is their purpose in life. And their purpose in life is to make certain properties of the S matrix manifest. One of them is locality. The fact that the particles uh, in the point light in momentum space is translated uh, in position space, is translated in momentum space to one over p square propagators. Yeah, so that's exactly the momentum space, uh, the momentum space version of locality is, uh, is that these, only these poles should appear in the S matrix. And that's indeed what does in Feynman diagrams because all Feynman propagators have only these poles. So that's built in. The uh, other thing which is built in is unitarity. So we think about unitarity as S dagger S is equals one for the S matrix, but you can think about it, what does it mean perturbatively? And perturbatively it means that uh, on these poles, if you set E squared to zero, the amplitude should factorize into two pieces. And that is again guaranteed because we just draw all Feynman diagrams, all possibilities we have to draw and therefore, if you just cut one propagator, if you sit on a pole, on both sides, you reconstruct the full amplitude. So locality and unitarity are built in in Feynman diagrams. There is a loop level version of unitarity. It's kind of, you probably saw these pictures in the context of optical theorem, but there exists a version for the amplitude. If you cut two propagators, now it loops, it also has to factorize into two pieces. This is a three level of this. Okay, so this is uh, this Feynman diagrams just make that manifest. But what is the price to pay? And that's the loss of manifest gauge invariants. So we have massless spin one particles. We describe them using polarization vectors. But of course, this is not a unique description. We can always shift epsilon going to epsilon plus alpha p, and nothing should change. But the individual Feynman diagrams are not invariant under this gauge transformation, but the full amplitude is invariant. So this huge cancellation between Feynman diagrams, you can think about it, that most of the stuff kinematically is just alpha dependent in each Feynman diagram. But once you sum it, this alpha dependence cancels, and you just get a simpler expression. OK. Uh, now, uh, what is the lesson from uh, this part Taylor calculation? Is that the gauge invariance plays an important role. So if you want to see any simplification, if you want to land directly on this simple answer, we have to preserve gauge invariance at all steps. That's what Feynman diagram is going to do. And also, it's good to talk about helicity amplitudes, directly about fixed helicities, not just to talk about everything. Yeah, something nice happens if we talk about helicity amplitudes when the helicities are fixed. Oh, I'm coming in and Yeah, I'm coming in and out. Okay, so uh, now what are, uh, so of course this, this is a subject coming back to late 80s, so people did many things in the meantime, so let me just say how people use these ideas to actually do some calculations. So, uh, in, uh, so the, ba the basic idea is to change of strategy, so we would like to answer the question, what is the scattering amplitude? On one side it's a sum of Feynman diagrams, so Feynman gave us this description, uh, this uh, prescription, how to do the calculations. But we would like to think about the amplitude as a unique object, as a single object completely fixed by certain properties. Of course, this idea is not new. Um, back, go back, uh, it goes back to 60s uh, in the analytics S matrix program, when people exactly try to do that. They try to fix the S matrix using certain physical properties, but Back in the 60s, they were not able to do it. They were not able to find what these properties are and fix the S matrix uniquely. Now, uh, from why not? The, they didn't know what is the complete set of these properties. Hmm. Yeah, they didn't know it. But we, well, from today's point of view, we know what they did, why they didn't know. Yeah, they didn't work in perturbation theory. They just wanted to flat get the full S matrix. And that we have no idea how to do. Well, okay. yeah. that's true. Under the name of bootstrap, after all, 
right, right. So, so you can try to approach that numerically and try to find these things. But well, they try to just do it for any quantum field theory, no CFT, right? Any quantum field theory, just to say, well, this is the theory. What is the asymmetric number? Again, with all totally due respect, currently bootstrap people are for are also asking the same question. They are asking, asking the theory. same question. Yeah. So what is it that they miss that today's bootstrap people are not missing? Well, they. They didn't think about conformal symmetry mm -hmm. at that time. They were thinking about massive scalar particles. That's what they were obsessed by. Because they were obsessed by QCD. But QCD didn't exist, but they existed these hadrons. And they just wanted to, mm -hmm. to get the proton scattering and ex mm -hmm. the scattering of these hadrons just non perturbatively, which is insanely hard question to think about it. Yeah. So they were not able to do that. And uh, well, from today's point of view, we, would like, we are doing the same thing, but we just use perturbation theory. So they didn't have perturbation theory. They didn't think about perturbation theory. Yeah. Of course, the conformal bootstrap thinks about it from the opposite point of view. Yeah, you, want to, you want to approach some strong coupling regime. And you, again, well, in principle, it's the same. You are using physical principles. So they use the principles of the factorization and so on. So it's just different ways how to approach the same Thing, but in the 60s, they just wanted to get flat everything from scratch. And they were not able to do it. But they kept looking at perturbation theory to guide them to different they, that is Exactly, <laughs> you are right. They, were, they kept looking at perturbation theory to get some hints. But, uh, well, I, I tell a little bit in details why we are able to do something in loops. It's because we don't think about the loop amplitude. It's too complicated functions. We are thinking about loop integrands. They are still rational functions. They didn't think about that. OK. So, uh, so let's think what these principles are and uh, how we can use them from today's point of view. So I already spoke about the unitarity. So just let, let's just look at the three-level unitarity. So it means that if I have an amplitude on the pole, p squared goes to 0, where p is just some sum of uh, external momenta, the amplitude should factorize. Now. Uh, so this is, I, this is what we call an on-shell condition, because there was a virtual particle before there in Feynman diagrams P square, but now it's on-shell. We made the, that, that particle physical on-shell, and then the thing, uh, and then it must factorize into these sub-amplitudes, where this particle is again on-shell and physical, yeah, before it was unphysical. OK. Now, the on-shell constructability means that this factorization, just knowing all the information of that type, fixes the answer completely. So if I want to write a three-level amplitude, this m tilde, uh, just the fact that it's on-shell invariant, on-shell uh, gauge invariant function, and it's some correct weights, let's say the diagonal weight, a certain number of derivatives. Of course, you can increase the number of derivatives, but then you are speaking about different theories. And it properly factorizes on all channels. This completely fixes and kills them. There is no other function which would satisfy the same properties. Uh, if this is true, then the amplitude is, of course, then uniquely specified just by these factorizing measures. Uh, this is true for a very large class of theories, including standard model and other things. Yeah, it's not true completely general. Of course, if you have, uh, if you think about it from the Lagrangian point of view, if you have, a, if you have some. Uh, operator, let's say 5 to the 10, and it is an extra coupling, of course, you cannot get this one. Yeah? You cannot get something from nothing. Yeah? The amplitude is then not fixed completely. You have, to, you have to supplement some information about it. But OK, but let me, let me say in the context of the Yagnos theorem, it might be Sorry, more. So uh, well, let me say the Yagnos example, and then, then it might be more clear. So, uh, let's look at the four-point amplitude in Yangle's theory. We have these four Feynman diagrams. Now, I said that uh, I want to think about the amplitude that's completely specified by factorization. So if I do S channel, T channel, or U channel, I should get a product of two three-point amplitudes. And this directly hits these three Feynman diagrams. So I get information about it. You might ask, what about the contact term? The contact term doesn't have any factorization. How I can possibly detect it? Well, the thing is that the contact term is fixed by gauge invariance with the other terms. If I just take these three Feynman diagrams, they are not gauge invariant. I have to add the contact term. If you have gauge invariance, if you have a scalar theory, there is no gauge invariance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that was my point. So suppose that I have a phi cube theory, mm -hmm. 
then I can, the same thing as here applies for phi cube theory, but suppose that I turn on the phi four, to the four. Phi to the four. Right. Then the four point amplitude is not constructible because I have to get some information. Of course, once I have four, the five point now would be constructible and six, seven, and eight if I don't turn another thing higher. Yeah. So there is some conservation of information. Yeah, you cannot get everything from nothing, but in the Yangos theory, there is one coupling. Yeah, there is one, uh, one independent structure, which for me is the information about the three point amplitude. The four point, uh, the four point, uh, the four point interaction is then completely fixed with respect to the three point. Yeah, I cannot just randomly change the four point interaction. The thing wouldn't be gauge invariant. Okay, and in gravity, it's actually even more dramatic because if I should take uh, just the Einstein gravity and I expand it in the fields, I have infinite power of fields. But just knowing about the cubic one already fixes the rest. Yeah, so therefore I can, I can ask, does the 10-point amplitude factorize this correctly on the poles? And if it does, it's a gravity amplitude. There is nothing else. There is no 10-point independent contact term I can add. Yeah, because there is a 10-point contactor, that 10-point contactor, but it's fixed with respect to all others. So, going back to phi to the fourth theory, yeah. if I give you information about the uh, contact four-point coupling, yeah, will would that be sufficient then to figure out the uh, higher point. like higher point yes, function? Yes, exactly, it would. Yeah, you don't need new information, no, even no. though it is uh, no gauge mirror. There's no gauge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, 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 yeah, it has nothing to do. In principle, okay. it has nothing to do with gauge mirror. Yeah, I just wanted to demonstrate. Okay. Just having a contact term doesn't mean mm -hmm. uh, yeah anything. But of course, with scalar, there is no gauge invariance. The four point interaction is independent. But once you give me that information. From the point of view of amplitude, just give me what is the four-point amplitude, and it will have uh, two couplings. It will have the three-point coupling and a four-point coupling. If I know that, I can just go then to higher points. Okay. Yeah. okay, now, uh, so, okay, so that's great, right, but how to construct the amplitude based on that? Well, the first guess would be just to uh, be very simple guess, uh, is just to write left amplitude, right amplitude, Pole, one over p square, and just sum over all factorization channels. Well, of course, that's wrong. Yeah, that would be too simple. The problem is that you have overlapping channels. Yeah, if you sum over some p's here, there is one over p square pole here, but the, the left pole can be also hidden on the left or right amplitude for other channels. Yeah, because these m left and, and right for one given channel also have another pole. So I cannot just sum over all. But there is a technical solution how to do that, and it, uh, called, that's called BCNW recursion relation. And uh, you have to do some complex shift of momenta. You shift two of the external momenta such that you preserve the on shellness of these momenta and momentum conservation. Then you get some function mz, which depends on some shift parameter z. And then you use Cauchy's formula. And the fact that this mz as a function of z can be reconstructed from its poles. And the poles of in mz are exactly on p square goes to zero. Now shift it p. And from that, you can actually write a similar formula as I wrote before. Just this ml and mr are not amplitude. They are amplitude and some shifted kinematics. So that's what is called ECAW recursion relation. So this is the way how to reconstruct that higher point amplitude from the lower point just technical implementation of that idea that the amplitude is fixed by factorizations. Okay, now, uh, so, and this method is very general. You can basically use it for uh, all renormalizable quantum field theories, including gravity. Uh, in, uh, there are, it doesn't have to be just these recursion relations. These BCW are kind of the minimal one. When you shift two momenta, you can shift more and you would construct more theories. We also did it for certain effective field theories where exactly there are these higher point interactions which seem to be unfixed. But then there is some other information that comes in, some information about soft limits, which spits out some theories as constructible. One of them is nonlinear sigma model, which in principle has infinite tower of term. DBI action is another example, boring belt action. But just a sigma model, still, uh, those are fixed by symmetry. Exactly, yeah. However, but that symmetry is yeah. not, you cannot think about it as factorization. The symmetry implies some property of the S matrix. The shift symmetry of the sigma model 
implies that the amplitude vanishes in the soft limit. When you send P to zero, it vanishes. And if you supplement that information, there is a technical way how to do it in two these recursion relation. You still reconstruct on the sigma model. Similar for the DPI action, there is some higher dimension Lorentz symmetry, if you think about it as a scalar on the brain, and that implies certain property of the amplitude, you can again supplement it into that and reconstruct these amplitudes as well. Is your discussion assuming two derivative theories so far or not? Uh, well, it, uh, it, yeah, you mean that the propagator is just the canonical, yes, yes. But the interactions? The interactions can be higher derivative, but there must be a canonical kinetic term because mm -hmm. otherwise we don't know what is locality really sure. because there are not one over these. Yeah. So uh, we said we have a higher point amplitude are built up of lower point one. Yeah. So is the smallest building block a three point? Yes, uh, it will be the next lesson. Yeah. So uh, yes, indeed, the three point is the smallest building block. Okay. Uh, in principle, all these statements about recursion relations is a trivial mathematical statement about reconstructing the rational function from singularities. That's what we really do mathematical. mathematically. Mathematically, amplitude is a rational function, it has poles. We want to reconstruct it from its the residues on these poles, which are these lower point amplitudes. There might be poles at infinity, then we cannot use the Gauss formula anymore, but we can actually do it if we can supplement it by this information about what these poles at infinity are, and then in certain cases, now, what about loops? Uh, of course, it's a difficult problem. The loop amplitudes are complicated transcendental functions. They are not rational anymore. And the space of these functions is not even known beyond one loop. Now, we know that one loop, uh, loop, ampli well, one loop, uh, loop amplitudes, uh, uh, one loop amplitudes are just some dialogues and logarithms, but even at two loop, there are some generalized polylogarithms, but the space of functions is not known. Now, what is the statement of unitarity? So, can we get some handle of what these functions can be? Well, it's definitely related to branch cuts of these uh, transcendental functions. But the precise statement is still not known. Yeah, so therefore, we don't know what is the statement of perturbative unitarity for the amplitudes. Yeah, we know that there are branch cuts in these functions. They correspond to some physical singularities. The amplitude should do something on the branch cuts. But what is the precise statement to all loops? In other words, you need to know something about the jump uh, discontinuity yeah. for it to be in it there. Yes. Okay. But isn't it given by something like the Boskin? Yeah, so, so that's, uh, well, indeed. So there is, a, there is some Katkowski rule, but that relates the imaginary part right, of, of, of the amplitude to the cross section. But I, what, what I want to say is if I just give you the function and I claim this is my loop amplitude, there is no way how to check if it is correct or not. There is no known way how to check. At one loop it is, yeah. At one loop we understand what is the space of functions. But beyond one loop, well, you can, for certain special cases when you know something, perhaps you can check it. But not something like what I said here at three level, yeah. Here at three level, uh, this factorization, you just give me some function and you say, well, that's my 100 point amplitude. And I check. Does it just factorize everywhere correctly? If it doesn't, it's wrong. If it does, it's correct. We don't have an analogous statement for loops. Yeah, I don't know what to check and how to check it in order to say that you get a right loop on this. Well, the unitarity says that there is some. Yeah, We know that the full S metric, the non perturbative S metric, satisfies this S dagger S is equal to 1. But how exactly it's realized in perturbation theory, we don't know. But what we know, and that's the main reason, from my point of view, why the S metrics program failed. We just don't know what these rules are. But we can still do something, and that's what people did in the last 20 years, is that we can focus on a different function, not of the final loop amplitude, but on an integrand. So let me just quickly say what the integrand is, just something simple. If you think about the amplitude as a sum of Feynman diagrams at loop, there is some integration. So let's just, instead of integrating each final diagram and then summing them, we just split the integral and sum, and sum all these rational functions together and get some loop integral. And of course, this is not uh, uniquely defined. You can always add a total derivative, and it doesn't change the loop amplitude. But the idea is that there is actually a unique integral which satisfies certain unitarity properties. And the unitarity properties here are the picture that I already showed before, you have this loop integrand, and you do the cut, you would go to the second singularity, 
and it factorizes into two sub amplitudes. Yeah, so it's a, exactly the analogous statement as for the three level. Now I have a tool how to check that something is correct. Yeah. Somebody gives me a five loop integral, I just have to check all these unitary figures for all possibilities. If it, if it uh, indeed factorizes properly, then it's correct. Well, there are many ways to choose the to many ways. double cuts, right? Many ways, uh, yeah, exactly. And the rules are known how to do it? So no, you have to check just all of them. Oh, <laughs> Well, you can check a subset, and normally the subset is enough, but in principle you have to check all of them in order to be sure that you have the right answer. The way how it works, well, I have it on the next slide in these unitarity methods, is that you, well, let me just show it on the next slide. Any arguments to I What? I, how many arguments? Is this just a single integral over Well, no, 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 so this was just kind of schematically it's one loop, you have many, many loops, right? So then it depends on all the loop momenta, yeah? So here the idea, suppose that this is five loops, so it should factorize if you cut two into three and one, four and zero, two and two, yeah? There are all, all different possibilities how it, how, how it can factorize, yeah? But, uh, yeah, but, uh, but the statement is that if you look at one subloop and you cut it through it factorizes. Okay, so now uh, we actually can use this picture in one special case, and that's planar equals for super Yankov's theory. I will not talk much about this theory, but it's this, our simplest version of four dimensional interaction quantum field theory when we can do, uh, when we can find some particle reconstructions. And in this case, we can actually we actually found those recursion relations similar to these BCFW for this integrand function. Just knowing its singularities, we were able to reconstruct it. This also means there were no poles at infinity in our recursion formula. Just knowing that fixed everything. Yeah. And the recursion relations was just a technical method how to do it. But uh, this idea of the loop unitarity for the loop integrand has been used since 1990s by Bernd Dixon and Kosower, and it was kind of an intermediate step. Yeah. How should I think about poles and It's uh, well, it's uh, uh, well. I, okay, I can uh, tell you, it's something, for example, which doesn't have these cuts. Yeah. So I said that there were these contact interactions at three level, which cannot be fixed by factorizations. Similarly, suppose that you have something like that pole. It doesn't have a double cut. You cannot cut two propagators, so you cannot fix it. The top pole, well, there are some subtleties with the regulators. The top pole actually, the massless particle integrates to zero. But you can have something which are called rational functions, which don't have the dependence on the loop momenta, even at loop level. And that you cannot fix by these things. So there are certain integrals which cannot be fixed by that in QCD, for example. In supersymmetric theory, we are protected uh, not there. But, uh, yes. Yeah. QCD Yes, so it, it, for example, if you do even a one loop calculation in QCD, uh, just checking these uh, unitary, these double cuts, which are also called unitary cuts, is not enough to fix the answer. You are getting almost everything except some small piece, which you are not getting because it's some just. non singular, polynomial dependence. Yeah, it's a polynomial thing which you cannot okay. fix. Yeah, so that's in QCD. It's called rational term. So it's called it like that because they don't have any, they come from. Uh, they come from, uh, yeah, they are come from integrals which don't have propagators, yeah, which are just pure polynomials. Yeah. Of course, there is some regularization issue and so on, but in the end, what you get is some function which doesn't have loop momentum dependent, so you cannot cut it. Yeah, there is nothing to cut. It's like these contact interactions, but it should be fixed by something, but it's not exactly, it's not understood. How exactly. So people use normally some tricks, go to some special kinematical limits trying to get these pieces. Yeah. The supersymmetry has because of power counting. So you are you cannot get these things because you have get supersymmetry. Yeah. Supersymmetry kind of eats up this polynomial dependence in the numerator of these of these integrals. But you also have constraints like on the gross event uh, On what? On the gross event is kind of yeah. it also yeah. constrain this issue. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there are certain constraints that people exactly use that to capture these pieces as well. 
Yeah. So yeah. So there are there's some cross are bound and these so different things. So you can things. quantify like this ambiguity. So. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so no, no. People calculate to, to see the amplitudes. It's not that they cannot calculate it, but you need to know more than just this simple rule that it just factorizes and you are done. It's correct. Yeah. It's not true. Yeah. You need to know more. Okay. But uh, how people use that uh, idea of factorization since uh, early 90s? It's uh, kind of intermediate step. Instead of talking about Feynman diagrams, you just write a bunch of uh, integrals, some basis of integrals with unknown coefficients. And then you just impose that the amplitude factorizes correctly on one side, and you fix the coefficients on the other side. So this is what, is, what goes under the name of generalized unit And you are using the fact that the cuts of loops, integrands, are products of three level amplitude. This is the simplest version of that, but of course you can factorize farther here. So here you've got two propagators, you can cut more and more, and this factorizes and continues to factorize until you have three point amplitudes at three level. And uh, that's exactly that the pictures that you have are called on shell diagrams. And uh, yeah, get it. Okay, so these are the atoms of the amplitude. So the question now, you can reverse the question. What are the natural gauge invariant objects that we can consider? These are scattered amplitudes. And we would like to build the new amplitudes from some simpler amplitudes, exactly as the BCW return relation does. Uh, but if you iteratively use this procedure, as was already mentioned here before, it reduces to some elementary amplitudes you cannot factorize farther. And these are three point amplitudes in most interesting theories. Of course, you can argue there are certain theories which have put them into four point amplitudes, but I would claim that the most interesting theories are three point amplitudes. It can be done with four point, it's just less constraining than with three points. Okay, so now three points. So I'm not even now talking about amplitudes, but just three point kinematics. What is the three point kinematics? Three point on shell kinematics. So I have three particles, and I uh, massless. I say that p1 square, p2 square, p3 square is equal to zero, and I also satisfy momentum conservation. This is very constraining, and the best way how to see it is use so-called spinner helicity variables. Then instead of the four momentum, I talk about two spinners. Yeah. For those who haven't seen it before, yeah, just believe me, there are two spinners that can represent one four momentum. Uh, there are Pauli matrices which transform the space-time indices into the, into the spin matrices. And then I can define two separate invariants uh, of these lambda spinners contracted with epsilon sin 4 and lambda sin. So that's the notation. That's how Park Taylor also wrote their amplitude in terms of these matrices. Now, uh, if I then use this, uh, if I then use this uh, formalism to solve momentum conservation, I actually get two solutions. Either all these lambda spinners are proportional, or all these lambda tilde spinners are proportional. Now, uh, I didn't say anything about the momenta being real. This is for complex momenta. If I further impose that the momenta are real, then lambda and lambda tilde must be complex conjugate. And in order to satisfy momentum conservation, all lambda and lambda tilde would have to be proportional. And I would get that they actually have to be zero. So for three point real momenta, there is no solution to the three point kinematics. Therefore, we just don't have any three point amplitudes in the real world because there is just no solution. But if we are happy to live in the complex world, which for many reasons is a good idea, there are two solutions. And now, uh, the, thing, the good thing about amplitudes at three point is that they are actually completely fixed just by Poincare invariants. If you specify what are the spins of external particles, h1, h2, h3, uh, the, the, um, the form of amplitudes is completely fixed just by Poincare invariants. And there is some general solution for any helicities for this type and this type, supersymmetry makes the uh, bookkeeping much simpler because then you don't have to care about individual helicities. You really have super fields, and especially if you have n equals four, maximal supersymmetry. I don't have to really say what are the helicities on external legs. It's uh, 
because there are all different combinations include, in, well, included in the super amplitude. So I really talk about super amplitudes. These expressions are not important. I'm just showing that there are some simple three-point expressions uh, for the super amplitudes in this case. Note also that uh, these amplitudes don't get corrected at loops. The reason is that there are just no kinematical invariants. Yeah, P dot P is always zero. So the only thing that you can possibly get, suppose that there, there is some coupling constant here, this coupling constant can be just corrected by a number, or there is nothing it can depend on. There is the log, there is no argument for any log or anything like that. That's free point. So I can always say that the G is just my G. I just relabel what I mean by G if I calculate the corrections. But it's the good thing about the free point of massless particles. Of course, if that's massive, they get corrected as loops. It's a different story. And now I can draw these diagrams. I can just stick these things together. And uh, these diagrams uh, are just product of three point amplitude. These elements are building blocks. I drew here. I can just take the product and build these objects. And the meaning of these objects are that there are cuts of loops. Because that's what these objects mean. This is a cut of the four. Point one loop amplitude if I set four propagators being on shell. All the legs, both internal and external, are on shell. That's the meaning of these objects. And therefore, because they are products of on shell amplitudes, they are gauge invariant. Yeah, so these are gauge invariant objects. So that's what I said early in the beginning. We would like to find some building blocks which are gauge invariant. These are the building blocks. And now uh, I can use these recursion relations to actually write amplitude using these building blocks. Yeah, it's just the same recursion relations, it's just reinterpreting what the terms are. So some particle at six point amplitude for three level is a sum of these three objects. Yeah. Yeah. So the three point terms in Spanish from the land of Tilda is the compass of the Yeah. But how do I see with the four point thing you just read the Yeah. So so the P one is real. Yeah. But the momenta on the internal lines are complex. Yeah, so. Uh, so How does that get averaged away? No, it's just that uh, these, the, the momenta here flowing in the loop are complex momenta. But the external momenta are real. Yeah. Uh, so if you just do this exercise at one loop, you just take the one loop box or one loop integral and you set four propagators to zero, the solution is complex momentum. Yeah. So it's also related to the fact that when you integrate over it, this singularity doesn't show up in the integration region. It's somewhere in the complex region. But uh, from the point of view of sticking these things together, there is nothing bad about being having complex momenta here. Because these are not external momenta, these are internal momenta. But there's some some uh, line in the growth. No, you just take really literally here you take the product of these four point uh, these four three point amplitudes. You you have to sum over internal state, but for maximum supersymmetry that's irrelevant if you have lower supersymmetry you have to sum over what is flowing in. Yeah. It's uh, this is how I just define this object. It's a product of what you see in the diagram. And because of the generalized unitarity, it happens to be the same as cutting the loop amplitudes. But so this is the integral? Well, this is just new objects. Yeah, I'm just saying these objects are cuts of the integrand at, from one point of view. Yeah, and from the other point of view, I can use them. They are gauge invariant objects. I can use them to build the three amplitudes out of them using the CFW recursion relations. Yeah. Yeah. So you see three amplitude, but then I see loops over there. Right? right, but these are there is no integration over the loop momenta. Yeah, these are on shell. Yeah, that's the big difference. Not a Feynman diagram. These legs are on shell, not off shell. Yeah. And the fact that they are on shell, this thing has zero degrees of freedom. There is no integral to beta. The, all these guys actually have zero degrees of freedom. Yeah. Because you can think about it that there are four integrations to be done, but I impose four conditions on top of that, that these internal lines are on shell, which fixes all four degrees of freedom. There is no integral to beta. So these are all three level objects. They look like loop level, but they are not. They are so three how level. do you represent the loop level? Uh, well, that's, uh, 
then you can build them also from these diagrams, but then you have you need to have some overall degrees of freedom left. So they look similarly, but uh, they they have they have some degrees of freedom left. So for example, here there is four conditions on one loop that fixes that completely. Here, if you count, there are eight conditions on two loop. The two loop momenta have eight degrees of freedom. Again, this is completely fixed. You just have to draw the diagrams which have fewer conditions than the number of degrees of freedom. They can represent the loop, uh, the loop integral. But the recursion relation gives us that. Only for plane learning to score the graph. We don't know the recursion relation for any other. Yeah. Ah, so this is, uh, yeah, this is, uh, actually, I wrote the other one. This is for the different helicity amplitude, which is not part of for C6 point, there are two independent helicity amplitudes. You have two minuses and four pluses. That's what Park Taylor did. This is three minuses and three pluses. It's kind of a maximally distributed helicity. In that case, it's a sum of three things. You can still write them on two lines. What about the previous slide? Or also, also six. So that one, yeah, good, good, good. So this is five point. This is actually a full five point amplitude. Six point, this is one of those. Uh, they don't look like that. Uh, there are certain moves on the diagrams that you can do, and they preserve the uh, result. Yeah. This is this is not the park Taylor. This is the park Taylor. This is the park Taylor. There is also one on shell diagram which represents again the park Taylor. But I should speed very up because <laughs> running out of time. Uh, okay, good. But uh, let me just say. So okay, so these are great building blocks. One should explore them more. Uh, but now what is the connection uh, to some mathematical structures? I shouldn't show any geometry, anything new from that point of view. The thing is that the same diagram were discovered by mathematicians in mid-2000 for a very different purpose. And they were interested in a completely different question. They didn't know anything about physics. They just wanted to know, if I write a matrix, how should I choose the variables in the matrix such that it has positive points? That was their exercise. Something completely different, nothing to do with physics. Yeah? So they wrote a two by four matrix. Uh, they chose some variables. There was some fixing that they chose one, zero, and zero, one for these columns. And they just wanted to know how should I fix the variables in the matrix such that it has positive minors. Yeah? So that was the question they wanted to ask. It goes under the name of positive Grassmannian. Yeah? And they happened to draw the same diagram. Well, it's not so surprising. You have diagrams with two colored vertices, you glue with three points, you glue them together. Maybe it's something very generic. Uh, but the connection is that uh, the thing that they did is to label the diagrams with some variables. It can actually calculate their diag these diagrams using the same thing in physics. In particular, for n equals four super young males, the same diagram given as a product of three point amplitudes can be calculated as some d log form, d alpha, d alpha over alpha, of the variables in the diagram with some delta function, which relates these alpha variables with lambda, lambda, delta. So there was some connection between the thinking math and thinking uh, physics, and it calculates the same thing. OK. There is a question why this is for n equals 4. What about other theories? In general, was z? Uh, z was, I just denoted collectively the lambda on the field of variables. Yeah. So this delta function just says that I should, from delta function, I should solve for alpha in terms of lambda, lambda, tilde from the delta function. OK, so this calculated, so there was a machinery coming from mathematics which calculates the same diagrams. This formula doesn't know anything about loop locality, unitarity, three point amplitude, spins, momenta. Doesn't know anything about it. The momenta are sitting in the delta function for some trivial reason, but doesn't know anything about physics, but it means something in mathematics. Yeah, it's a differential form which is logarithmic singularities on the boundaries of some space. And this space is called positive gas mania. This connection should exist for any UFD but uh, it has to be found. We don't know how it looks like. In a sense, for these diagrams, the, the type of singularity in this function f should define the theory, in a sense, as Lagrangian. But this is more speculative, yeah, I don't know. Exactly. We have constructed that for a few theories. 
such that mass as QCD, we can draw these diagrams, we can find this connection to this positive gas minor as well. Not planar diagrams, which is true planar so far. In supergravity, we also know what is the connection. Uh, but it's calculating these building blocks using uh, this movement. OK, so, uh, so at least for planar n equals 4, this thing in the block, in addition to the Feynman diagram diagrams, you can think about it as this sum of objects, and presumably for other theories, these for three levels for other theories that loops, this is still to be shown and constructed how to exactly look like, hopefully in the following years. But still, this is not a complete satisfactory description. It looks a little bit, it's not Feynman diagrams, the objects are different, are gauge invariant, has some connection to mathematics, interesting. But it's some expansion in terms of some building blocks. So it's a sum of things. And our motivation was always to search for a single object, just to see what is the scattering amplitude at given loop order for a given number of particles. What is that object as a single object? And that led to the amplitudehedron. But uh, okay, I will just go very quickly through that. Uh, the motivation actually got, got, goes back to 2009 that Andrew Hodges realized that he did the calculation in the BCFW of gluonic amplitudes, and he realized that the terms in these recursion relations can be represented as volumes of certain tetrahedra in momentum twister space. So this is some kinematical space, other than spinner helicity variables, reflect the planarity of the object. <clears throat> yeah, I don't have to go into the details. And he realized that he does the calculation one way, he gets two objects. He does the calculation other way, he gets three objects. But they glue together into one single polyhedron. So there was, it was for very particular calculation, gluonic, two goes to four for certain helicities. But it was an early kind of hint that there is some geometry representing the amplitude. That this is the amplitude, volume of that object. It took many years to actually generalize it to all helicity amplitudes. And the reason is because is that this is a volume in projective space. The generalization went to this Grassmannian space. And we, we didn't know about it until we learned about these other diagrams. So. Later, it was shown that all of these three, uh, the Grahidra is actually one of these three on-shell diagrams. Yeah. So, Mathematically, the form with logarithmic singularities on this Grassmannian space is a volume of this volume. This is the Grassmannian. Mm -hmm. Grassmannian is a generalization of the projective space. This is in the projective space, and that is the function. It's a twisted variable sitting at the, somewhere corners. in the side? In, in the corners. In the corners. I see. So there is a z variable, twister variable sitting in the corner. So you, you can say that once you know what are the momenta, you mm -hmm. You kind of transform it into twister variables, which go into the corners. But there are yeah. two types of lambda lambda tilde. Is there not a distinction between the? Yeah, components? the z variable is four component. It knows about both. Oh, I see. But it has a cyclic symmetry. It's not like momentum. It has a cyclic. You have to order them mm -hmm. one to z, one to n in some order. It's different than the four momentum, but it packages mm -hmm. the, the information in a little different. Right? What? What? When you said you can manipulate the diagram. What does it mean? Ah, no, 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 no. The manipulation just means that there are two different diagrams which give the same formula. Yeah. They're mathematically the same. They are not unique. You can do some merge, expand. Well, if you know. What does that look like when you do it? No, no. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's just the diagrams. Well, these diagrams actually also play a role in the classification of superconformal field theories. In that case, these moves are cyber dualities. So you change the diagram, but it doesn't change the answer. It's an identity. Okay, so there is so there is something, some volume interpretation, and, and it has to do with generalizing between the projective space and the Grassmannian. And in a sense, you can think this sum of onshell diagrams mathematically. Are